Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. Coming up, a sheepdog on loan. A few minutes with the great and powerful Doug Ritter, and we take a look at the camp and outdoor knives in my collection. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and while you're there, check out our other awesome knife content. We have Thursday Night Knives, our live stream. We have our Sunday interview show, which is always interesting and fun, and then uh, also our knife close-up videos, where I show knives close up under the, under the knife cam over here and just kind of talk. Now, speaking of showing knives under the knife cam and just sort of talking, today's pocket check. Today I have the Spartan Harzi folder. Spartan blades, uh, they came on the scene just blazing uh, when they did and getting um, Bill Harzi in there to design a number of their signature knives was such a great move because, uh, well, he's a great guy, but he just designs the most beautiful knives. And I feel like whether it's a dagger or a camp knife or a folder or some sort of a tactical uh, combat knife, you can always tell a Bill Harzi knife. And uh, this, of course, is no exception. And uh, I love this, love this knife. Took me a while to get it, got to say. I was kind of uh, watching everyone else enjoy theirs on YouTube. And then I finally located one, um, not realizing that uh, sometimes if you just call the company, uh, they might have a few laying around that they could put together for you. Um, so I uh, took my time, found one. And then once I uh, had Curtis Iovito on the show, he offered to engrave my logo on mine. So I sent him the logo, he engraved it in, and now this is just a prize knife. And if you if you will, kind of a, a mascot of the show because of that awesome logo engraving. Um, very, very happy to have this in the collection. And today, uh, that's what's riding in my front right pocket. Uh, something else I've been carrying a lot uh, from another great guy, uh, don't you know, is the uh, Ritter RSK Mini RSK Mark I. This is made by Hogue Knives. And um, it's sort of a uh, continuation, like the next generation of the Ritter Griptilian. And um, boy, Hogue Knives really took the ball and ran with it, making the handle a little bit longer and uh, uh, making the steel a little bit better. And uh, if you ask me, uh, their ABLE lock, which stands for ambidextrous bar lock enhanced, really is enhanced, uh, enhanced version of the axis lock. Uh, I really like the way this thing operates. And uh, this past weekend, I had a bunch of chores around the house, um, uh, including um, hanging two new screen doors, uh, something I've never done before. So I took a long time doing it because I wanted to make sure that I didn't spend all this time and then get it up there and see that it was crooked or see that the, it it jammed in the door jam or anything like that. So this was the knife that was opening all the packages. I did a bit of, uh, well, as you can see, pencil sharpening there. Uh, I, I had this sort of harebrained scheme uh, about how I was going to um, mark things out. Uh, it, it involved a couple of pencil leads and drilled holes and stuff like that. I, I ended up scrapping that strategy halfway through. Uh, <laughs> but it, if it weren't for this knife in my pocket, I never would have even gotten halfway through. Uh, I, I kind of put my common sense hat on and, uh, and figured out a better way um, to do it. But anyway, that was the knife I had in my pocket. And I, I really love that knife. And um, so... I've been carrying it for the last couple of days. Uh, that's a back left pocket knife for me um, due to the size. And uh, man, it's just so handy. Um, I, I take a look at those two knives and uh, I just think they make a really, really handsome pair of, uh, of knives. And I just like looking at them. If you like looking at knives, boy, there's no place in the world like Instagram. Uh, I've been posting pictures of my knives up there and also been posting um, these audiograms that Jim does. Uh, so we'll we'll do an interview show and then Jim distills out four, three or four like really golden moments from the podcast, gives them to me in these in these cool little graphic uh, videos and I post them on Instagram so you can kind of keep up with who we have on the show that week. And um, 
and then in between, you know, I can't help but just uh, put up these little these little pictures of my awesome knives. And I'd like them to look as if they're um, sort of impromptu. Oh, here, this is what I have in my pocket. <laughs> like I'm throwing them on the table and just snapping a shot. But you know, I spend a lot of time uh, trying to set them up and look nice. And then I can't resist the filters. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go through the filters just to make them look dramatic, make it look like I'm a good photographer. So check out uh, The Knife Junkie on Instagram. And uh, I'm not referring to myself in third person there. I'm just saying to find this content on Instagram, you have to go to The Knife Junkie. So Knife Junkie on Instagram for cool knife pictures. All right, well, I wanted to take this time uh, right here to mention a new patron we have, a new Gentleman Junkie. Gentleman Junkie is our top tier of support on Patreon, and uh, we're really, really quite thrilled to have uh, Clayton Workman with us now. Thank you, Clayton, for supporting us on the Knife Junkie uh, Patreon page. It's a, it's, how do I say this without sounding corny? It's an honor uh, when people such as yourself, Clayton, are willing to trade money for um, this content. So thank you for doing so. Uh, when you support us on Patreon, that money goes goes towards uh, helping pay for the different services we need to keep this on the air, uh, whether it's uh, server costs or um, audio um, enhancement costs, that kind of thing, so that my golden tones come through exactly how they should. And uh, also, if there's a little leftover fundage there, uh, we'll buy a knife or two um, and give it away or review it or what have you. So check us out on Patreon. Uh, the quickest way to get there is to go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. That's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Well, we had the honor of having Doug Ritter come on the show. Um, we've talked to him a lot, uh, whether it's on the regular interview show. He's come on the uh, on the Thursday night live stream. We call it Thursday Night Knives. Um, and he's a great person just to keep up with. Not only did he design this awesome knife I was just showing off, uh, the Mini RSK-1, but he is also the chairman of Knife Rights. Uh, that's how a lot of us know him. Also, uh, Knife Rights is a... Uh, it's an organization that has really helped all of us out by changing some antiquated laws in a number of states. And uh, so we had a chance to check out with, uh, check up with him, check in with him. So check it out right here. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Doug, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. Always a pleasure. So uh, you are, uh, Knife Rights is celebrating what? Tell me what, what's happening with Knife Rights right now. So we have just uh, this past Sunday celebrated the 15th anniversary of the Wall Street Journal article that basically was the spark that resulted in me founding Knife Rights. Um, that article, uh, how new deadly pocket knives uh, became a $1 billion business was just a overwrought sensationalist attack on evil so-called tactical knives um, that was really designed to inflame public opinion and try to start a movement uh, to try to ban tactical knives in the same way that in the 1950s, uh, they banned switchblades in, in many places. And uh, that was what got me incensed. I realized that there was no uh, aggressive, proactive organization working to, uh, to, to keep bad knife laws from being passed or to get rid of all these bad knife laws that had accumulated in the last hundred years uh, after the Civil War and during the 1950s. And yeah, there was no NRA for, for knife owners. There was no Second Amendment Foundation for knife owners. Uh, and that's what persuaded me to start Knife Rights. I, I, I realized I was pissed that there was nobody out there 
working for knife owners, working for knife makers, working for the knife industry to repeal these irrational um, laws. And, you know, <laughs> and I founded Knife Rights. And uh, here we are 15 years later. Uh, we started out, I, I coined the term a sharper future. Um, and despite all the naysayers, uh, we have delivered a sharper future. Uh, 34 bills enacted in 23 states. Um, I, I think that's a pretty good record of creating a sharper future. Well, I know we're, we're all uh, grateful that this guy, Mark Fritz, wrote that ridiculous article. And not for nothing, they, they put a ridiculous knife as an illustrator. It was just like a, as an illustration on that article. It's this little carabiner knife. It couldn't look more, uh, you know, um, uh, it, it couldn't look less mundane. Um, but, it, but it did fit their criteria. It, it, despite the, it was a buck metro, it was a little cap lifter and a one hand opening lock blade knife with a one and a quarter inch blade and that it locked open and that it was able to be opened with one hand was their criteria mm -hmm. for this evil tactical knife. It's just ironic that the, uh, that the, the editor decided to use that knife. It just, it just was perfect to illustrate how ridiculous this yeah. whole thing was. <laughs> uh, did you ever get a chance to speak with Mark Fritz, the author of that article? Uh, I haven't. Uh, I, I, I've avoided uh, poking that bear uh, mm -hmm. to date. Um, but, you know, it, less people think this was just from out of left field, which it was, I guess, um, in a manner of speaking. You know, remember that uh, the whole switchblade ban, the federal switchblade act, uh, all the the stuff that happened from Hollywood demonizing switchblades all started with a similar article in the Women's Home Companion uh, that was titled A Toy That Kills. That was all about the evils of switchblade knives in the night, early 1950s. Um, so an article can start a movement. Uh, in this case, it did start a movement. It started knife rights. <laughs> oh, Not man. what he was planning for, right. I'm sure. Right. What a what a lovely unintended consequence. Uh, so you mentioned uh, that part of the founding of knife rights was the fact that knife owners, knife enthusiasts, and the knife industry didn't have its own sort of NRA. Um, uh, what are you? What? is uh, knife rights right now uh, weighing in on it. Isn't there some second amendment thing that you're weighing in on right now? Actually, there is. You know, if you look at our logo, uh, it says the sharper future top and at the bottom it says essential tools and essential rights. And and despite the fact that we're the only second amendment organization that gets support from, from the left, we are a second amendment organization. And we just weighed in with a amicus brief on probably the most critical Second Amendment case to come to the Supreme Court. Certainly, it's the first one they've looked at in 12 years uh, that really talks about the ability to carry an arm outside of the home for self-defense. Uh, so this is this is a his potentially, well, either way it goes, it's a historic case. Mm -hmm. And we felt um, it was only fair for our members and our supporters to weigh in. We joined uh, with the uh, FPC American Victory Fund and a number of state level uh, Second Amendment advocacy organizations to file one of a number of amicus briefs uh, in support of the, uh, the, the in support of the Second Amendment side of this really, really critical case. I mean, it's not the first time we've done it, but this is the really the first time in 12 years there's been an opportunity to do so at the Supreme Court. Uh, right now, as we speak, I happen to be um, uh, palming your <laughs> Mark III. I love this knife. Um, I, you. I Yeah, you're welcome. You know, I saw that uh, I, I put up a review video, not a review, I call them close-up videos where I talk about the knives. This has been my outdoor companion uh, since I got it. I love this knife. Um, so I just figured I'd drop that in there. But before, and, and plus it's a great opportunity just to show off a, a beautiful knife. Uh, 
you're welcome. Uh, the ultimate steel. Tell us what's going on with the ultimate steel, and and for so, those so, who are new, what is it? So, in conjunction with uh, our fifteenth anniversary, we also launched the tail end bonus drawing portion of our ultimate steel spectacular. Uh, the ultimate steel is our annual fundraiser. Uh, we'll have about $100,000 worth of custom knives, production knives, uh, African safari, firearms, uh, ge gear. Um, it's really an extraordinary opportunity for folks to support us, uh, make a donation, get a chance to win. Uh, and since we've launched the tail end bonus, this is an opportunity to win in two separate drawings. Hmm. Um, it's really uh the way we fund all this work you know all the passion i have doesn't get us anything if we don't have the money to show up at the legislature to show up in court to do the things that we do you know unfortunately it takes money to be successful as an advocacy organization and i am so appreciative of all the custom makers and all the members of industry that have continued to support us with donations including donations for the ultimate steel uh just a great opportunity go to kniferights.org click on the ultimate steel and uh try not to drool too much over <laughs> what you could win well okay there you heard it uh go support knife rights go to kniferights.org uh click on the ultimate steel also there are a lot of great articles on there and other great resources um, some of the stuff I've really poured over are uh, some of the legal recommendations you have for different situations you might get into uh, with a knife on you. And those are really valuable. So definitely uh, go support kniferights.org. It helps us. It helps us with this hobby that we love or these, uh, you know, it helps us keep these tools that we need in our pockets. Doug, thank you so much for coming on uh, Knife Junkie podcast. I know you're going to be joining us tomorrow night. Uh, live on Thursday Night Knives, and uh, be, able forward to, to it. be able to talk to some of the some of the listeners and viewers. Uh, thanks so much for coming on, and thank you for everything you do uh, with Knife Rights. We appreciate it. I thank you because I can't do this without folks like you supporting us. Are you looking for a book about knives or knife collecting, knives and self-defense, or the yearly knife Bible filled with hundreds of pages of information and pictures about your favorite knives? Shop at thenifejunkie.com slash books for your traditional favorites, new books about knives, and the yearly knife Bible. Get your favorite knife book and support the show at thenifejunkie.com slash books. It's always great talking with Doug Ritter. And, uh, well, of course, this time was no exception. Uh, I think I think when we were rolling, or maybe after, I mean, before we started rolling, I think I invited myself out to his location to do an interview with him in person. Uh, so maybe that'll happen sometime in the future. I have a habit of doing that, inviting myself over to people's uh, places. And uh, so I'm, I'm gonna have to start following up on that threat. Um, uh, so you also have to check out tomorrow night. He's gonna be joining us on uh, the live stream Thursday Night Knives. He has promised to come on the show. He's going to come on. So you can actually talk with Doug Ritter tomorrow, uh, whether you come on with uh, come on the show itself by going to the knifejunkie.com slash join, or you comment. He will be on the show and you can talk to him about everything from knife rights, uh, what's happening in your state, because you know, he knows, uh, or talk to him about his awesome knives and his knife designs. So really looking forward to having him on the show. And then also, uh, I just saw a graphic pop up on screen, and it's something that I really need to remind you of, is that we have a lot of cool merch on the website. Merch, if you don't know, is short for merchandise. And uh, we have, uh, just go to the knifejunkie.com slash shop. You can get uh, our really cool logo on, uh, on shirts, T-shirts, mugs, all sorts of stuff, even pillows, which I find weird. But uh, if you need a knifejunkie.com, uh, if you need a knife junkie pillow, you can do that. But also, Jim has designed a couple of really cool other bits of artwork uh, that you can get on, on these T-shirts. Um, so some of them have the tagline, don't take dull for an answer. And then some of them uh, have a man without a knife is a man without a life. Of course, that uh, also translates to women. And then there are, uh, you know, lots of other cool things up there. So definitely go to the knifejunkie.com slash shop and get some cool merchandise or merch, 
as we call it in the business. Now, state of the collection. I want to show you a knife that uh, is not mine, but it's on loan from a great guy. Uh, his name is John. You know him as that fellow there, uh, that underscore fellow underscore there on um, Instagram. He's a service member with the military. Thank you for your service, sir, John. And uh, also thank you for loaning me this very cool knife because uh, I've never experienced this knife and I've never experienced a knife of the type. And that is the Emerson Sheepdog. And you know, I've experienced plenty of Emersons. It's one of my you know, very favorite knife brands out there. But when I say the type, I mean, this is the first Emerson flipper I've experienced. And um, it's been a, uh, a very eye-opening, uh, that, that sounds dramatic. It's been really cool to have it and check it out. Um, uh, so it's super smooth. And it's on bearings, you know, as you might expect. And, um, you know, it's so smooth that I kind of had to check the, this happens with me. Uh, when some a knife is really smooth, I get suspicious. And then I check the, if there's blade play or not. And indeed, there is no blade play uh, in either direction. No lock, rock, none of that. Uh, it is very smooth. I would say that uh, Emerson really nailed, um, nailed the flipper uh, thing, this, this, uh, I think this uh, Sheepdog series, no, I know the Sheepdog series was his very first uh, flipper. And uh, I haven't experienced anything, uh, any of the others. Now, he's since done the CQC7 in a flipper model, the CQC8 in a flipper model, which looks really cool, incidentally. Um, but this is the first iteration of the flipper. Now, one one little issue I have with it is that, and I don't know if this is due to the wear John has put on it, and he is definitely a use your stuff kind of guy. Um, when it came to me, the edge was pretty, man, pretty used up. And so I, I kind of cleaned it up a little bit. Uh, I would never presume to do that with anyone's loaner knife, but he, he suggested, he said, use it, sharpen it, you know, please do what thou wilt with it. So uh, I, I really, you know, I wanted to clean up that edge. There's nothing I can do about that little chipped off point there because uh, I'm just not willing to remove that much metal to get it there. Plus, I don't know if my skill levels are there, frankly. I send away my broken tips to Jared Neve. He takes care of that for me. Uh, but the one issue I have with this, uh, I will get to in a second, but first I must address the fact that this has this beautiful chocolate brown micarta uh, handle on it. This is canvas micarta. These handle scales were made by um, Tom Engelson. Tom has uh, a service. Uh, you can find him at blades underscore N underscore such on Instagram. And he makes scales for Emerson's, uh, I think a few ZTs and, and uh, um, uh, less George knives. But uh, man, his I've had a, him make a couple of scales for my Emerson's and I just love them. Not only that, but when you get it back, the knife is in better shape. I got to say, but what I was going to say, the one little uh, misgiving I have about this knife, and I'm not sure if it has been addressed in uh, subsequent flipper models like the seven or the eight or later versions of the sheepdog, but in the closed position, I do notice it has a little bit of detent play and uh, it doesn't really affect much. I mean, it, it, I'm not sure if, if this were my knife, I might take it apart and bend the detent bar, I mean the uh, lock bar, in towards the blade a little bit more. Uh, I'm not sure why that occurs. It occurs on some knives, uh, like my um, my zero tolerance uh, 0452CF uh, has a little bit of that uh, detent play in the closed position. It doesn't really affect things. It just, um, you know, if you're going to get real uh, anal retentive about your knives, that's uh, that's a that could be an issue. Now, to me, it's not much of an issue, but it is something I noticed. And since uh, Emerson Knives is relatively new to the flipper and uh, and bearings thing, I figured I'd give him a pass on that. Um, but when it's locked open, it is solid as a rock. So I've been really enjoying this. I'm going to do a close-up video on it, and then with a tear in my eye, send it back to John. Uh, I have... Uh, you know, I love the Bowie-shaped Emerson knives, and this is a great handle, by the way, the Sheepdog. Now, if I were to get a Sheepdog from Emerson, I would get 
the mini because the mini sheepdog looks like really fantastic to me. But also I'd get the drop point because it's one of those rare drop points where I just, I just think it looks great. Drop points to me are usually, like I mentioned in the last podcast, eh, a little vanilla. You know, I like something that's a little more exciting. Uh, but I don't know, something about that sheep point, uh, that uh, sheep dog drop point really does it for me. Um, one quick thing before I move on from this, the only other bearing um, pivoted uh, Emerson I've experienced is my very own um, Iron Dragon. This is a really, really awesome and I think quite limited um, Emerson knife. It's a uh, tribute to Richard Bustillo, who was... Um, Working in working with, uh, I guess, Danny Nosanto in his uh, California Kali Academy back in the day when, is that what it was called? Uh, when Emerson was training out there and uh, Richard Bustillo was his, was his main influence out there. And so this knife, uh, they used to call him the Iron Dragon. And so this knife is a tribute to him. Um, also very limited, as I mentioned, I got this from Alex from the Knife Box channel. And uh, he gave me a smoking deal on it. Alex, I will always appreciate that because uh, on bearings and Emerson is just as awesome as on uh, on washers and everything else. So I just wanted to show those two off. Another awesome looking clip point blade made by Emerson Knives. So there you have it. That's all there is for the state of the collection this week. Nothing new has come in this week. I, I'm trying to be a little disciplined. Uh, and And while trying to be a little disciplined. I did, I did order something else from the JB, uh, JB knives. Um, uh, I see that, uh, Edwin has something from JB knives. They, they do a lot of, uh, fixed blade, um, EDC fixed blade knives that tend towards the tactical. A lot of them, excuse me for this a little delicious black coffee. A lot of them tend towards the Pical style and they've got this one. It's called the ditch um the ditch pick i think a <laughs> terrible name terrible because it uh, it evokes a really horrible situation uh but the ditch pick double edged pical style knife and i say uh double edged pical because you had the option to have the forward edge sharpened and of course i had to do that so i i did uh, be sure to, if you want to see like liner notes on everything i've talked about thus far and what i'll be talking about afterward go to the knife slash 237 that's the number of this episode and that's the quickest way to kind of get right to the episode and also find the uh, the liner notes if you will i know they're called show notes but i like saying liner notes because it reminds me of the old days with the uh, with the record albums with the 33s the lps and i know hipsters uh, have their own collections but you know that's what we used to get for christmas mom and dad i want pyromania by def leppard and then they'd go and they'd find the LP. They'd go to a record store. They didn't just go to Amazon and they'd buy that for you. So if you want to find the liner notes to this show, go to the knifejunkie.com slash 237. Okay, so you know my tastes probably. My tastes tend towards this kind of thing, this kind of tool that I don't really need, uh, but I do really need it in my collection. This is the, uh, this is the Randall number two model seven. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, model 2-7. And the 7 refers to the style of blade, or the, I'm just jacking this all up. The length of blade, 7 inches, and model 2 is a dagger. This is the commando style handle, which uh, someone was kind enough to remind me of in the comments on this video, just this very same day. This is the kind of thing I really like. This is the kind of thing I really collect. Uh, but of course, I don't use it. This has a very limited... Uh, uh, sort of usage. Um, this is a combat knife and I don't do combat. Uh, but thank you to all of you who have done combat and have kept me and my family safe. I greatly appreciate it and honor you whenever I can. So thank you for that. But today we're going to talk about a different kind of knife that there is a preponderance of in my collection, I found out, uh, just in sort of going through them and, and seeing how many I have. And those are the camp and outdoor knives in my collection. And you might ask, why were you wondering how many camp and outdoor knives you have in your collection? Well, 
the story begins here with the atrocious state of politics in this country. Uh, I've taken a summer break from my usual political podcasts. And, you know, no matter where you come down on politics, if you listen to a political podcast, it's going to get you riled up. Uh, no matter what side of the fence you might sit on or and no matter what your political persuasion. And you know what? I was like, it's summer. I don't want to be riled up. I don't want to be riled up. So I decided, you know, I've always had an interest in the paranormal. I'm going to I'm going to listen to some paranormal podcasts. Well, I settled on the Sasquatch Chronicles. It's a podcast I love. And before you start to snicker, um, you might want to give it a listen. It's rather interesting. It's it's an interview show and people come on and uh, and give their encounters with strange things in the woods. And let me tell you, as an art major and as a guy who knew a lot of theater majors and a lot of actors, good acting is a very, very hard skill to develop. And I have come to, to, uh, to the point of view that these people who come on this podcast and tell their stories of seeing weird things in the woods are not acting. I can tell from their voices, they did not go to acting school. And, uh, and I can tell from their accounts, they've experienced something now, whether it's a mass hypnosis or not mass hypnosis, whether it's a mass delusion or something, I, I can't determine. But, but the people who have come on this podcast uh, are, are relating real experiences. And I would say 80% of them are hunters. And they're always setting up their story about going out in the woods and, and being someone who's lived in the city and now in the suburbs very close to the city for the last 30 years um, or 25 years, I, I pine for a life uh, further away from the city, let's put it that way. I don't, not that I want to live in the woods, but I, I have a sort of romantic notion about retiring to the country. And, uh, you know, when I was an art student back in the day around all those actors, uh, I spent a lot of time in the woods and did a lot of uh, artwork based on nature. And uh, I kind of miss that. So listening to these people recount their weird experiences in the woods has gotten me to think about camping a lot this summer. Have I done any camping this summer? No, I think I'm, uh, I'm going to go in the fall uh, with a good friend of mine and uh, he's got all the equipment and I'll borrow <laughs> or 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 leech off of in any case. And, um, uh, but I can bring the knives. That's for sure. I can bring the camping knives. And so I want to show you what I've got here because I got some pretty cool ones. I realized, all right, that's a long setup and uh, please excuse me. And don't think that I'm an absolute nut job. I'm sure you think I'm somewhat of a nut job, uh, but, uh, don't let that intro color your view of me. All right, the first knife I'm going to show off here is a true classic. I'm going to start with some of the classic knives and then move up to, to some of the more modern camp knives. But this is the Mora Classic 611. This is a uh, Swedish knife. You know, Mora knife comes from, from uh, Sweden. And this is a true classic. I mean, just look at this handle. It's very unmodern. Now, Mora has a lot of very modern knives with the plastic and rubberized handles and the, and, uh, the coated blades. This is an uncoated carbon steel blade. You can see I've used this quite a bit, uh, mostly actually in this room doing shop kind of stuff. Um, I've used this to carve out kydex. I've used this to shape wood for shims and other kind of stuff. I mean, sharpened pencils, all sorts of stuff. But uh, this is a classic outdoors knife um, with this, uh, I think it's a beech wood handle. And um, I could have could have done the research on that. I know that's what people are saying. Uh, but it's a wooden handle painted red. And uh, it's got the single quillion guard. They have one with a double quillion guard. They have one with no guard. I figured uh, I figured for a knife like this, you probably want to have your thumb here to, to power through things like wood, but you also probably want to have at least one guard down on the bottom stopping you from running up on this very sharp Scandinavian edge blade or Scandi edge blade. Scandi edge blade, if you don't know, is a, a zero, zero ground blade, which means that uh, the bevel itself is the cutting edge. It's not like a regular knife or, or a, a usual, that's not, neither of those terms are correct, but it's not like a, a knife like this that has a bevel and then it has a final cutting edge down here. This bevel is the cutting edge. Uh, it gets a knife very, very sharp and uh, robust. Uh, great for 
wood woodland type tasks, uh, especially like carving and whittling wood. I got this one quite a while back. Uh, it's got a plastic sheath and uh, this hangs on the pegboard of my shop here because that's where I tend to use it a lot. I say shop, that's a glorified term. This is a small den or man cave and I have a little uh, tool section with a with a, uh, a drill, you know, a, a drill press and all my stuff kind of over against the wall. And this hangs there because it is a very, very useful knife. And uh, I think it would be a great backpacking knife because it's very light. All right, next is another classic. Now, this one was a gift to me from a wife's cousin's husband. And uh, I wasn't expecting a gift. It was on my 46th birthday, I believe. And uh, I'm so happy to have this knife because I love it. I've always loved it. This is one of those knives that when I was a kid, I would uh, I would gawk at in the hardware store. Um, and uh, it's a Buck 119 fixed blade. It's got that classic, just classic, beautiful clip point uh, blade with the fuller in it and the deep hollow grind, the uh, high uh, cutting edge here, and uh, the clip. It's just I mean, this is a classic knife. You look at this and this says, Screams Outdoor Camp Hunting Knife. Uh, this was one of the first designs developed uh, by Buck, uh, Buck Knives. And uh, this version has the phenolic handle, this sort of plasticky handle, and, um, and the 420 HC steel. Uh, the past over the past year, I believe it was 2020, they came out with their um, uh, elite versions of these, which have the S35 VN blade and green canvas micarta handles. They are just knockout, man. They are beautiful. Uh, I'd love to get one of those, uh, but since I have this one, it kind of scratches my buck 119 itch. Uh, of course, I would accept it happily as a gift, um, but I think. I think the gift giving on this one has been done. And uh, so here it is. One thing I've always found interesting about this design is how wide the handle is. The handle comes to the same width. It's a very girthy handle, comes to the same width as the guard, something you don't see often. Uh, I used to think it was too much. Now I, I don't think my hand has grown, <laughs> but now it feels you know, really, really comfortable in hand. And I can see why they did that because, uh, I would, you know, uh, it really fills the hand nicely. And if your hand is larger than mine, which probably 50% of you out there, your hand is larger than mine. Uh, this is a very, very nice and hand filling knife. And if you're using this to dress large game or something like that, and I don't mean put a tie and coat on it, but, uh, open it up and pull its guts out, you might want something girthy like this because the handle is slick. The material is slick there. So um, just a classic. I love this knife. And uh, I leave a, a comment. Let me know, or you can call the listener line 724-466-4487. And let me know what was the movie, the horror movie that featured this in the poster. It was like hanging down by the waist and down by the side of a killer. Was it Jason Voorhees that used one of these or was it uh one of the one of the um, Halloween movies. I just I don't know, don't remember, but I do know that that blade was featured in a horror movie um, poster. So let me know. Okay, another classic, uh, made by a um, a modern company, but it's a classic knife. Is the Condor? I'm gonna pull it out of the sheath. I'll I'll take all these sheaths out, take them out of all of their sheaths before I present them. Well, actually, I should show the sheath. This is a leather sheath. And I don't think I showed you the buck knife sheath. It is the standard leather sheath with the with the cuff around there. Uh, this is a Condor Hudson Bay knife. Uh, Condor Knives is a, is a company that started and is down in uh, El Salvador. Started as a machete company and an outdoor knife company. And that's still what they specialize in. Uh, in the past few years, they've had Joe Flowers, a acclaimed outdoorsman uh, and knife designer, designing a lot of their knives. Um, but this one is taken from the Hudson Bay knife. Now, the Hudson Bay knife has a cool history. The Hudson Bay Company was a is a is still, but uh, originally was a Canadian uh, fur trading company and and other products. But uh, they so they had a whole legion of uh, 
fur traders out there in the in the west and up north and in Canada and um, uh, they uh, think of the movie The Revenant basically this is when this when this uh, knife was developed uh, for the Hudson Bay Knife Company it was uh, produced by a uh, originally by um, Sheffield Cutler uh, called uh, what was it called the Carlson and Jukes uh, uh, Coulson and Jukes Company or Jukes and Coulson uh, Knife Company uh, uh, in uh, Sheffield, England. And the, the whole concept behind this was it, it was a do everything knife. Um, so you could dress large game, dress out large game with this uh, buffalo or elk. You know, you got this giant blade to do all that sort of work, but uh, also could take care of all your camp chores. And this large eight and a half to nine inch bladed knife would be uh, kept on the belt and, and would preclude the, the need for a belt axe. So they could uh, use this to split wood and do all sorts of camp chores, as well as uh, take care of their skinning tasks and such. Um, very interesting history. Also, uh, there were two grades of this knife. There was one that had the, the three pins like this uh, condor version. And then there was one that uh, called the chief's uh, grade, chief's grade that had a, uh, a um, what do you call it? Uh, a bolster here and then two pins. And then the two pins had washers around them. Actually, I think all versions of them had the washers around the pins, but the chief's version had the two pins. And uh, so that would have a big metal footprint here on the handle and uh, the Indians at the time would call it the knife with eyes, which I think is so cool, the knife with eyes. So a eh, little, little interesting tidbit of history here. I love the Condor uh, company. I have more than I thought. I have, I have five Condor knives uh, and they're all really cool, very stoutly built. Uh, this one with the sort of hammer style is, uh, is an interesting look. This was a gift from my good friend, Kurt. And I used that knife to chop down like, I don't know, eight uh, big, gnarly, prickery bushes we had in the back before we put on a, an addition. And um, so that knife has seen some, some use, some real use. And uh, I, I love it. I'd love to get a Bark River Knives Hudson Bay. They make a Hudson Bay in the Chiefs sort of pattern. So Hudson Bay knife, there you go. Next is also an outdoor kind of classic. I mean, it's becoming a modern classic. Let's put it that way. This is the SRK um, survival rescue knife from Cold Steel in its uh, molded, what do they call it? I don't know, Grivex, or I don't remember what they call their version of the, of the injection molded sheath, but it's in a plastic sheath that works very well. And here's the knife. It's a, it's a uh, clip point six and a half inch. Let's see. What is this? Okay, one, two, three. Oh man. One stage fright here. One, two, three, four. <laughs> okay. It's a six and a quarter, six and a half inch blade, uh, with the, with the, uh, grip with the, I can never remember what they call this either. They're rubberized handle craton handle with the knurling pattern in there. And, uh, this is with the carbon V steel. So this is the the least expensive version of this knife. I got this uh, in 2006 when my wife, who was at the time my fiance, went to London to open up a uh, an office over there for the company she was working for. I built her this whole um, uh, get, uh, uh, what do you call it, bug out bag. And this was the knife I put in there. I I'm quite sure this was not uh, UK legal, but I put it in there anyway and sent it through the mail to her. And uh, so that she would have this in case something happened in London and she had to bug out into the into the countryside there, she'd have a capable knife. Um, so that was, you know, quite a while ago. And I guess uh, 14, 15 years ago now. And um, this knife has never seen any use. Thank God, because it's been in her bug out bag all this time. And recently, oddly enough, made its way into my collection case. Uh, I figured, you know, we haven't. And now that we have a house, you know, we used to live in New York and having a bug out bag was essential to living in the city. 
now if we had to bug out, we'd have a few minutes to get our stuff together and throw it in the car. So uh, I kind of took this out of the bug out bag, leaving only a couple of other knives in there. So the SRK, cool thing about this knife is that it, it's a, it could be a combat knife. You know, you, this would be a great uh, all-arounder, I think, for someone in the service because it's a nice thick blade, but not too thick. It's got a nice swedge on there. You could easily sharpen if you wanted to, uh, you know, to get a nice oblique kind of fighting edge on the swedge there, if that were interesting to you. Uh, but also, I mean, just a great and capable survival knife. Uh, it's got this nice... Uh, generous ricasso area you can really choke up on the knife like this as if there were a choil there and put the the guard between your first two fingers there and uh use it like this so this really is kind of a, a combat camp all-arounder fixed blade knife and uh that that uh, carbon v is nicely coated and uh it's not it's not that uh, spray paint coat they used to put on some of their knives back in the early days uh, in the nineties, it's a really stout, stout kind of coating. So, uh, that knife is, uh, it's a great one, uh, great all around outdoor knife. Next is one that I've used quite a bit in the back 40, that's 40 yards by 40 yards. Uh, and that is my, um, tops knives, Tex Creek, uh, in this beautiful pouch sheath. I love this sheath. Uh, I made a Kydex sheath, a very good one, actually, because I thought when I initially bought this, I thought this was going to be an in the waistband EDC. It ended up being big and heavy uh, for that purpose. Uh, so I just kind of have stuck with this pouch style because it's way more convenient when you're out, you know, noodling around in the back, cutting vines, cutting saplings, doing whatever, using this knife to just pull it out and drop it in, pull it out, drop it in. So I've really grown to love this uh, beautiful leather pouch sheath double stitched, etc. But this isn't about the sheath. This is about the knife, the Tex Creek. Uh, and they also have a Tex Creek XL, which I've always been kind of interested in, never pulled the trigger on. Uh, looks just like a bigger version of this. Uh, but this is a great uh, saber ground knife here. Um, this is 1095 with the, with the acid rain. Is this that the acid rain finish? Maybe. Oh, I see a little red rust right there. Better better get to that. Uh, but it's a, it's got a nice coating, um, has never, um, really shown much, uh, rust, uh, but I, I do see it happening right there a little bit. I'm not sure why, cause I haven't used this one in a while. Uh, but you've got, uh, my Carta handles nicely contoured. When you look at it, uh, from this, from this aspect, it's dorsal or pectoral aspect. It's got nice jimping, back on the back of the handle, an excellent jimping right up here, especially if your hands are gloved. This works really well because uh, those jimps are, uh, you know, kind of generous, larger, um, kind of tops style jimping, and that grips the gloves really nicely. Um, as you can see, maybe you can see, I'm not sure, uh, I've resharpened this a number of times because uh, with the lanyard here, if you if you kind of well there are different ways to hold it i like to hold the lanyard like this and uh, you can get some pretty nice chopping action out of this light chopping of course uh but the the uh, quarter inch blade is just heavy enough uh to to get a little bit of chop in there i mean it is distal tapered so it's not super super uh um heavy actually it's not distal tapered but with the swedge and the and the um and the saber grind here up towards the front it, it kind of has that appearance and effect so it's it, it is it's a light enough knife but you can get some good chopping here anyway my point is i've hit the chain link fence we used to have a chain link fence that runs along uh, it's been replaced now but uh i've i've divoted out uh, some some little notches on this and had to sharpen it out and that 1095 it's nice and tough it stays nice and sharp but when you do something stupid and you hit a rock or you hit chain link fence or something and you knock a little piece out it sharpens up really quickly uh so this was uh my outdoor knife for a few years uh now i'm i'm trying out some other ones uh, which i'll show you in a, in a minute or two so um Love the Tex Creek. Uh, it'll always have a, a fond 
place in my heart. It'll always occupy a, a warm place in my heart. You know what I mean. I like it. All right, next. We have two. Um, this is another company that I was like, oh, man, I do have quite a few fixed blades from this company. And that company is Spyderco. Uh, I have four. I have five fixed blade Spyderco knives. And these two were both gifts from my brother-in-law for, for Christmas or birthdays along the way. And it's great because my brother-in-law always gets me a knife as a gift and I love it. And he always gets me something that I end up loving that I never would have thought to get myself. And the first one is the Temperance II by Spyderco. And it comes again in a beautiful leather pouch style sheath. Um, just, just a stout, beautiful chocolate brown sheath and um and it's kind of water molded to the to the blade itself or to the knife and the knife handle and the knife itself is a vg10 full flat ground this is distal tapered that's something they brag about here so i'll, I'll show it off um knife here full tang knife with uh bead blasted um micarta handles also in this sort of lovely chocolate brown canvas micarta uh, with two pins there and it, one of the most just hand pleasing knives ever it feels so good in hand everything from the feel of the material this this micarta just has a sumptuous feel uh, to the sort of coke bottle handle uh, when you look at it again from its dorsal aspect it's got a coke bottle shape and then just this very pleasing for forward and back uh, for uh, fore and aft finger swale with the with the bird's beak here it just feels great and then it's capped off by this awesome thumb ramp here um full fully flat ground vg10 that is just sharp as all get out and to me this knife is another one of those knives that could flex i mean this could actually um you know probably be a pretty wicked knife if you needed it in a sort of tactical uh, uh, way, you know, if you needed to fight with it, let's say. Uh, this would be awesome because it's very slicey, very pointy, feels great in hand, and has an excellent, uh, as uh, Nut and Fancy would say, excellent traction plan in that you're not riding up on that blade. You've got the finger guard here, you've got the the uh, thumb ramp here, which is has awesome jimping. Um, so if you needed it for that, it would be great. But I think that this is much more of a camp knife. Um, I don't know. Let me know what you think. I, I You don't see much about the Temperance uh, 2. At least I haven't. So I'm curious what people use this for uh, themselves. But from the sheath uh, and from the shininess of it, I would say that this is more of a camp knife. Um, Something Spyderco does that kind of makes me chuckle. Uh, they have to put that circle in everywhere because it is their trademark. And um, in some places, like on the, um, oh, what is it? I've been going off about it recently. It's one folding knife that I really like. It looks kind of like the Emerson CQC8, but they put the hole in there. And I'm like, you didn't need to do that. Just didn't need to do that. Over designs it a little bit. But on this knife, I think it looks awesome. Um, and, and I love the old school uh, writing here, Spider Co. I think this is a Taiwan made, oh, Japan. This is made in Japan. Uh, usually you see that, uh, that print, that Spider Co font on the, um, on the Taiwan knives. Interesting thing here. It looks like they kind of forgot to smooth this out a little notch there, but in any case, love this knife. Thank you, James. He has gotten me just like my brother, uh, my brother-in-law who, well, he is my brother now, uh, and has been for the last 13 years, but he has gotten me some really, really awesome knives. And that's one of them. The next one is another um, fixed blade Spyderco that uh, James got me that I just didn't think about. And then he got it for me and I'm like, man, this is cool. I've done a video on this one uh, out in the woods with my daughter. This is the Spyderco Serrata designed by custom knife maker Ackerman. Actually, I don't remember what his first name is. Uh, comes in this Bolteron sheath here. Uh, and as usual with Spydercos, it has a very generous, uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, generous profile here. Uh, you know, if I cared to, I, I could trim down all the way around here. Um, but eh, uh, excellent. I love this clip attachment that they have. 
but here's the knife. This is cast 440C. So you don't hear of casting knives too often. So cast 440C, and apparently the casting makes this 440C very tough and also very uh, edge retentive, if that's a term. And um, I think it just looks great. And Serrata to me um, evokes Escrima, you know, uh, there's a there's a type of escrima called serrata escrima, uh, but I do not see this as a fighting knife. You could, of course, you could fight with any knife, but uh, if you look here, there's not much in the way to stop you from coming up on the handle if you were to thrust with this. So this is not intended for that kind of knife. This is a camp knife, and if you look at it again from the dorsal view, you can see how wide it is at the handle. This is not a lightweight knife at all. Uh, but you can see how it tape, uh, tapers towards the tip. There's a nice distal taper, reduces weight, and also uh, reduces drag as you're cutting through stuff. And uh, if you do have to puncture with it, it reduces any sort of puncture drag. Again, you'll see on this blade, their signature circular hole, <laughs> round hole there. Uh, yeah, Spyderco is, they're such ballers. They have a patent on the circle. I love that. Uh, G10 handle scales are nicely contoured, again, in a Coke bottle fashion. This just feels sumptuous in hand. And here you go. Here is uh, knife maker Ackerman's um, maker's mark. Cool with the tomahawk there. Again, sorry, I, I, I did my research before, but I'm spacing on who Ackerman is. His first name is Stuart. Stuart Ackerman. Okay. Nice pins. I just love the look of this knife. I have used it a couple of times uh, um, just electively in going out and seeing how it performed. Uh, there's a there's a, a video somewhere on my channel of me and my daughter out in our favorite spot in the woods, and I'm pounding it through something or pounding it into something. Uh, great knife. All right. So, so far we have the Mora Classic 611. We have the Buck 9, uh, 119. We have the Condor Hudson Bay knife. We have the Cold Steel SRK, the Tex Creek by Tops Knives. We have the uh, in, um, uh, Spyderco, um, I always forget the name of this knife, the Spyderco Temperance 2, and then the Spyderco Serrata. Next, one that I was talking about quite a bit recently, the Bark River Knives Boon 2. To me, this is just the classic American belt knife, uh, 19th century early 20th century classic belt knife uh, for camping and hunting and all out all things outdoors uh, sort of a precursor to the k-bar uh, is this design and uh, not for nothing but they uh, bark rivers bark river knives does make incredible sheaths and a little feature that I love is how when you unclip it they have a little extra tab on the leather back here and you can stick the uh, stick the strap behind there. So when you pull it out and put it back in, if you're using it a lot, um, you're not cutting the strap. Beautiful sheath, but here is the knife. So this is the uh, CPM 3V version. Uh, so very tough, gets very, very sharp. I think that's a blemish there. I might have to, yeah, yeah. I think I might have to oil this knife and kind of uh, work that little blemish out. But this classic clip point blade with the big fuller here uh, to lighten things up also gives a little bit of uh, structural rigidity, kind of in the in the style of an I beam in a building. It's got uh, aluminum guards. This knife you can get with just one guard, like that. If you find yourself in this position a lot and you don't want, you know, with your thumb on the back of the blade and you don't want this poking into your thumb, I don't find it to be a problem. But then again, I haven't really used it in this fashion much, um, but you can get it single guarded. Uh, you can get, because it's a Bark River knife, you can get it with a million different handles, uh, all sorts of exotic woods, micartas. And this is the, um, and uh, this is the black stacked leather. I just wanted this in stacked leather because to me, it, it really evokes what I was going for in buying this knife, which is that, which is that classic American camp knife from, from times gone by. Really nice uh, pommel there, also aluminum. I'm not sure if you'd want to hammer with that pommel, 
but it looks like it's set up for that. I guess you could pound in tent stakes and stuff like that if you were pounding on something with a generous surface area, but that is where they uh, screw the tang to the handle or, you know, build the handle around. There's the screw tang there and it is aluminum. So you don't want to do too much heavy pounding uh, with it. But uh, I've been using this one outside, kind of uh, trying this out a lot. It Most of my Bark River knives are not used, you know, um, like the two giant Bowies I have just kind of sit there in the, in the cabinet. They're safe queens, if you will. And I don't want anything to happen to them, but I really wanted this to be a use knife. So I use this outside these days. This, the Tex Creek, and then one that's coming up or two that's coming. I mean, I've, uh, you know. I can never just settle on one. So I'll go out with one on my belt and then I'll have another one near me and I'll switch around. Um, the only thing they really see are vines and saplings, but still we got to do something. I'm not going to use shears. I'm not going to go out there with shears. Okay. So uh, this is the Bark River Boon 2 in CPM 3V with the stacked leather handle, black and leather handle. Just a classic, man. I love the way it looks. Just looking at it right there. Just a nice looking knife. Next comes to me from a uh, a new knife maker a new new uh, an outfitter from Newfoundland Canada the Newfoundland knives ranger you know I've been talking about this one a lot recently uh, here it is nice stout leather sheath this knife is Cerakoted in red as you can see made by millet knives in d2 quite a thin blade stock here and uh, this contoured and polished wood handle. I've taken this out quite a bit, uh, doing the doing a lot of the same stuff with it that I do with the other knives. Um, just you know, uh, carving, carving out saplings, chopping down saplings, and uh, you know, devining things. It is very sharp, very very sharp, and a uh, and a nice thin knife. A lot of these knives are a, a bit thicker. This one has remained nice and thin. I mean, you know, not remained nice and thin, um, but it it is nice and thin and uh, quite tough. And the Cerakoting protects that D2 steel, that tool steel. Uh, this is made, as I mentioned, by Millet Knives and um, is just a, a great knife. I'm really looking forward to seeing what the uh, what John over there at uh, at. Uh, Newfoundland Knife Company. I'm looking forward to seeing the knives he's coming up with. He has gotten uh, quite a bit of um, knives coming out. I've been seeing him prototyping things. Uh, you can see him on Instagram and uh, the prototype knives look great. And I know that Millet Knives, who uh, you're going to see interviews uh, with uh, an interview with quite soon, uh, I know that they're going to be building another one of his knives and are quite excited about that relationship. You can find them on Instagram and um, see what they're coming up with. This knife, if if red isn't your thing, this knife comes in other, um, other Cerakotes, gray and black, I believe. Uh, the red, by the way, is very nice if you're going to uh, be setting it down in the woods. Uh, you know, it's going to be easily found, let's put it that way. Uh, unless it's autumn, then who knows? Maybe it'll blend in with all the leaves. <laughs> okay. Uh, three more here. Stick with me. You're going to love these. Oh, my gosh. All right. The next one uh, you've seen me showing off recently, that is the uh, Off-Grid Knives Grizzly. Comes in a nice Kydex sheath. This is marketed and designed as a camp kitchen knife. And I haven't used it at camp, but I have used it in the kitchen. And it is awesome. It is awesome at the at the kitchen knife um, roll. Now, if you look at it, it's got a long straight section and then a bit of a, a bit of a belly up front towards the tip. And this acts as a cleaver. You know, it's great as a cleaver, but you also have uh, with this belly uh, good cutting uh, pull cutting uh, capabilities here. Um, like if you're uh, uh, cutting up chicken or something like that. Um, you know, and, and I don't know, maybe in, maybe in hunting, but like I say over and over, I've never gone hunting, never, uh, dressed an animal like that. So I don't know, but that curve, uh, definitely helps in cutting meat 
in the kitchen anyway. Another thing I love about this, this nice thin blade stock with jimping, like the handle itself is kind of tactical, kind of kitcheny, and you got that jimping there. How many how many kitchen knives do you have with jimping? Exactly. But the width, this is a two inch wide blade and very, so very broad, very high grind, thin blade stock. It is very thin behind the edge, very, very slicey. And then this, all of this surface area here on this wide blade is great for scooping up ingredients to get to the pan. So you chop, 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 scoop it up onto the blade, drop it in the pan. So this is a very well thought out knife. This is Aus 8A. So a Great kitchen knife steel, by the way, because it hones up really easily, gets a wicked sharp edge, um, and is stainless, and in this case, coated, so it's kind of double stainless. So excellent knife. I love my off-grid knives, Grizzly. And actually, um, we have an affiliate link with them, so if you feel like buying an off-grid knife or this off-grid Grizzly uh, knife, you might think about buying it through our affiliate link. All that means is we get a tiny portion of that sale uh, back from off grid. So it's a nice, nice little deal. Um, so check that out. Yeah, I, I dig their knives so much and I've, I've grown my collection quite a bit. Uh, and Carrie offered that to me and I said, yeah, let's take it. So try our affiliate link. You'll be glad you did. So will I. All right. Uh, last or second to last is, uh, you know, what? I'm going to do that one last. No, 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 I'm just going to do it now. Uh, this is the Doug Ritter uh, RSK, and all of his knives are RSK. RSK stands for Ritter Survival Knife. This is the Mark III. The Mark III is just, poof, love it. So first of all, it comes in the one nylon sheath that I have that I actually really dig. Uh, this nylon sheath, as you can see, has the straps on the back. Uh, with double snaps, you can snap it here or snap it here. So it uh, you can put it on your belt, uh, straddling a belt loop um, so that it won't move around. But you can put it on without taking your belt off. This also, I think, is Molly compatible, maybe. Uh, I think that's what the double snaps are for. Um, comes with this nice length of uh, 550 paracord and a really, really stout plastic shell on the inside. That is very, very tough. So it's not going to poke through that. Uh, the blade is not going to poke through that sheath at all. And you've got this nice plastic run here so that when you resheath it, you're not gouging your, your sheath. Uh, this I've done a lot on recently is a very, very good outdoor knife. It's very light and it's S45VN, which is new to me. And it's got a very high saber grind, extremely slicey. I would imagine that this would be a great backpacker knife. If you're backpacking and hiking for hours and hours and hours on end, and you want a capable fixed blade on you, I think this is the one. It's got a nice five and a half inch blade. And yeah, five and a half inch blade, five and a quarter, I think. And uh, it's very light, very slicey. You could do a lot with it. You could puncture with it, but you've got this long straight uh, portion of the blade you can do all sorts of stuff with. Uh, it's got a nicely contoured G10 handle with that uh, radiant pattern milling that you see on the famous folders that he makes. So just an outstanding knife. Um, this would be my pick for uh, hiking and uh, taking a fixed blade hiking for long distances because it's not going to weigh you down. But man alive, is it a capable, capable knife. All right, lastly, but not leastly, of course, is the Ontario Artac 2, um, sort of the precursor to the Hungless. Uh, I have this in a an aftermarket, can't remember who made this now, but Nutton Fancy recommended it back in the day, aftermarket Kydex sheath. And this thing is just a beast, uh, just a giant long 10-inch uh, 1095 blade and uh, even a just a giant handle too that kind of very hand filling um, handle. And, and by the way, that size of that handle seems to absorb shock when you use this as a chopper or a batoner. This is an excellent batoning knife, excellent chopping knife. Uh, it's got a, a full flat ground wedge shaped blade and cross section and is just tough as hell. I mean, and uh, a funny story. Uh, I don't know if my brother thinks it's funny, but he was chopping wood with his. Uh, I think he's got the hungless. 
and looks just like this thing. And uh, it deflected off of a piece of wood and buried itself in his cap. I'm not laughing because I'm just I'm laughing because uh, I've done some made some big mistakes with knives. And uh, this this uh, brought him to the emergency room. And many stitches later, he had a story to tell. Um, I think it involved a bear when he told the story. But uh, in any case, the the uh, Artac 2 is just a classic camp knife and definitely on the large side. Um, so here you have it. I like the way it looks with that uh, purple fob next to that natural tan canvas micarta. All right, there's the lineup. I hope you've enjoyed this cataloging of my camp and outdoor knives. Um, I realized that tactical isn't the only thing I love. I love these outdoor knives. I love them all you know, and, um, but, but a lot of it just comes down to taste. And, and, uh, if I had my druthers, I'd have a lot more of this style knife. And, uh, and by this, I mean this kind of tactical daggery knife, but what a pleasure to have real usable everyday kind of big fixed blade knives. All right. Well, that about does it. I think I've talked long enough about this awesome variety of knives. Uh, so happy that uh, we could have Doug Ritter come on the show and uh, tell us about the 15th anniversary of Knife Rights and the Ultimate Steel and all the other good stuff they're doing. It's always a pleasure. Be sure to join us tomorrow night on Thursday Night Knives. That's live on YouTube, Twitch, and Facebook uh, to talk with Doug and to hear what he's got to say, please join the conversation. Go to the knifejunkie.com slash join. Set the phone up uh, aimed right at yourself. Put your head uh, earbuds in and come meet me. I'd love to meet you. If you can't swing that, comment, and uh, we'll, we'll address your comments right there on camera. So for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I am Bob DeMarco saying thanks again, and see you next time, and don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.